Um, the choir members are really excited about this concert, I think. Yeah. Um, the, the Brahms are sounding great and the Parries are such fun to sing. Yes. So what was it that made you programme the Brahms and the Parry together? It's an inter interesting juxtaposition that I've always been wanting to programme because Parry was a huge admirer of Brahms' music and when he was studying he actually wanted to have Brahms teach him. He applied to Brahms and Brahms actually turned him down. But he was a huge admirer of Brahms' music and throughout his, his output there was a, a lot of Brahmsian influence in his music. <clears throat> the audiences I don't think will be aware of that there's such a close connection between Brahms and Parry and mm. some audience members might not even put them at a, at a similar period of, of time. Yes. Was Parry particularly influenced in his writing by Brahms in his composition? Yes indeed, I think it, particularly in the structure uh, Brahms was um, very much a traditionalist in terms of structure. Um, he was a great expert at counterpoint um, in sort of the German tradition of, of, of um, Bach and, and then Haydn and, and Mozart and, and Beethoven more, more recently before him. And uh, Parry was certainly, as was Elgar, was um, really keen on having a, a strong form, a strong structure around which you could make, you know, your, you have your input. Um, Brahms, although he was a traditionalist, he was able to insert into his, his forms some very exciting, innovative um, ideas, and Parry was the same, although he was sort of conservative in terms of the structures he, he, he used. He had very innovative and, and interesting ideas put in them. And so, uh, when, um, when Brahms died, Parry wrote his uh, elegy. Yeah. Uh, and obviously that's, you know, that's inspirational for him. Yes. Um, does that also have elements of Brahms within it, or is it... Yes, I mean, it's, it's not a de deliberate pastiche. <coughs> um, but you can certainly hear some Brahms within the music, yes, and in some of the string writing and in some of the, the woodwind writing as well. Um, yes, definitely, but it, it wasn't a direct pastiche, it was just an outpouring, 1897, and, and Parry was, you know, deeply moved by this, this man's death, who he, he regarded as being the, the greatest composer of the time. And Brahms... Um, uh, himself uh, inspired to a certain extent by Beethoven. Yes. Uh, but his music different. It's obviously moving, moving forward. What what is it in Brahms' music that moves him on from from Beethoven? Well, I think it's just development of of, of themes, um, development of harmonies. I mean, certainly the the, the melodies that the Brahms uh, composes are, are much more romantic. I mean, Brahms is perceived as as moving on from <coughs> sort of late classical um, of Beethoven, maybe early romantic, to being full-blown romantic. And it's much more heart-on-sleeve sort of tunes and harmonies. But again, within this, this formal structure, I mean, Brahms regarded, I think he said that he wanted to honour the purity of these, of these forms. And uh, this is a, a requiem that we're, yeah. that we're singing. Um, and in, in other composers, this is something that inspires a, a requiem. Um, yeah. Is there something in, in Brahms' life that inspired him to write this? Well, he denied it, but I think most people believe that the, the death of his mother um, in 1865 um, was obviously a, a very you know, powerful influence on him. Um, and he started writing the Requiem soon after that, in the same year as her death. Um, but also lingering thoughts about Robert Schumann's death, which was um, 1856. And again, he, Robert Schumann's a powerful influence on, on Brahms. So I think these two people sort of um, moved him into, into to writing this, this Requiem. And, and is that why uh, he chose <coughs> German text rather than the standard Latin? No, Latin, no. I mean, I think, I mean, Brahms was not really a, a, a believer in, in sort of traditional sense. He didn't, he wasn't a Christian. Um, and he, if you know, one were to put a label on him, you'd say he was a humanist. And he wanted to, um, he wanted the people, obviously of Germany, to understand what he was writing, what, he, what the music was about. And he'd written to, to Clara Schumann, Robert Schumann's um, widow, about in, in 1865, saying that he wanted to do something with everybody to understand, you know, maybe a sort of German requiem, and this is where the title, you know, came from. Um, and it's, it's a piece which doesn't, I mean, obviously it doesn't use the Latin requiem text. Brahms chose the text himself from the German Lutheran Bible. Um, and it's very clear from the text he chose, he was thinking more about the living than the dead. So the first movement isn't about 
um, blessed of the dead is blessed are those who mourn. So he's looking after the human side rather than those, I mean, yes, in the last book when we talked, he, he talked about the blessed of the dead. But throughout the, the work, um, really movingly, he's talking about the human side of, of, of life and death. And that makes it quite different from, from a traditional song requiem um, as well. And, um, well, I think, I think the, the, the difference is that because it was so personal to him, because he had chosen the text, he was able to express himself in a very free-range way. And now this is where Brahms moves from being the traditionist to Brahms the innovator. You know, this is the first time that a composer has written uh, a requiem in the vernacular. Um, and the first, person, first composer really to have composed a requiem, a humanist requiem, which is not very much, you know, um, bound by the Latin text and, and, and the, the, the Catholic liturgy. This was a, this was a, a requiem for the world, for everybody. And as such, it must be a really uh, great piece for you to, to rehearse and, uh, and direct. Uh, what, what are the things that you find particularly exciting about a performance? Of yeah, the well, there are two things. I mean, the, the, they're wonderful melodies. Because this is so personal to him, you know, he, he, he's inspired to write these wonderful melodies. So beautiful. Um, and it's, it's really expressive, and what I'm going to try to get into the performance is just the expressivity of, 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 of the lines, of the harmonies, the shapes of the phrases, and making it as, as, as lyrical as I possibly can. Um, but juxtaposed with that, there is this quite um, sort of muscular Germanic style as well, and there are two huge fugues at the end of the third and sixth movement, which, um, you know, great counterpoint, but also great music, really stirring, stirring stuff. It's uplifting, there's some really uplifting passages. Yes, I mean, it has everything. It has this, this wonderful beauty. And um, when you, you can be as expressive as you possibly can in, in, in directing it, and hoping that the orchestra and choir band with you. Um, but, but also, you know, really, yeah, really strong, uplifting music as well. Mm. Fantastic. And you mentioned that uh, in the third movement, there's a sustained note that's, mm. um, that's quite extraordinary. What, what, tell us more about that. Well, the whole of the fugue in the... In the um, third movement, which is long in itself, it goes on for pages and pages, underneath it you will hear this, this pedal D, just a low D, all the way through it, above which is this extraordinary counterpoint, and he builds and builds this tension until he, you know, almost comes unbearable, and only finally, right at the end, is it all resolved on the D still, but it just, you know, the way he, he builds this tension throughout these pages of this fantastic view is really terrific. It's amazing terrific. that so much can be done with one yeah. line. And, and yeah. um, for audience members, uh, which part of the orchestra is playing that? Is the well, it'll be in the, the probably in the trombones and the double basses, you know, the, the low instruments. Lovely, it's yeah. a nice vibrating yeah, yeah. low D. Don't listen to the violins in the first time, in the first movement either for the audience, because yeah. they don't play in the first movement. Right. <laughs> it's all quite sombre, sort of sombre, dark dark time during the first movement. And pay attention to the choir in the first Absolutely, yeah. And, um, and a little bit about the parry anthems yeah. that are singing. Now, um, uh, these are anthems that choirs have sung for, for a long time mm. and loved for a long time. Um, and we programmed this concert some time ago um, before the, the royal wedding where yeah. both anthems yeah. were, were chosen and sung. Yeah. Uh, what is it about them that's particularly stirring or that, that really sort of grabs you when you hear them? Well, do you know, I think it's just he writes a fantastic tune, Parry, and, and you know, that's another similarity he has with Brahms. Both wrote wonderful tunes, and, and um, I think these days there are many people who, who feel that you know, tunes don't, don't get written as they used to. But yeah, I mean, it, it's fantastic tunes, and it's the way it, in Parry, in, in the I Was Glad particularly, but also in Blessed Pair of Sirens, and builds up tensions again. You know, in the, lat in the latter part of Blessed Prayer of Science, there's another of these pedal points, like is in the Brahms. And again, it's exactly the same, the same sort of method where he just builds, builds, builds the tension, and then it's released. Um, and it's, it's incredibly exciting. I mean, they're fantastic fun to sing, and I think you, um, you can really kind of let yourself go yeah. when, you're, when you're singing them. Yeah. And they clearly have a, a real appeal, it's just sort of quite, quite hard. I think they're beautifully written for the choir and orchestra, really beautifully. I think Parry knew exactly what he was doing when he was writing for the choir. Did he but, write a lot of choral? Is it an area of expertise of yeah, you? Yes, I mean, a lot, of it is, it? a lot of it is not, not sung these days. He, he wrote a lot of oratorios, um, which have pretty much gone out of fashion. Um, there's some very good, very good things. I mean, the, the, the Dear Lord and Father Mankind, which comes from Judith, which is a you know, full-scale um, oratorio, doesn't get performed these days. And, and I think 
it's just gone out of fashion slightly. Mm. Um, but I think you know he writes very well for voice. He writes very well for orchestra, and audiences love to hear it. And the uh, the elegy for Brahms is something that audiences may not have heard. It's not, is it often yeah. programmed? No, it's it? not. No, it's not. But I, you know, it's it's a great piece. It's it's again, it's really passionate. It's Parry at his most passionate, and I, you know, I defy anybody to remain unmoved by it. <laughs> so the audience <laughs> and the performance are going to be wiped out by the end of this. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs>